to uh, uh, give you a five minute warning. So you'll know when to. Yeah, I'll go 20 minutes, but you can if you want. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for coming to Malvern Books for an uh, afternoon reading here. Um, we're so grateful to have you all and to have your books here on the table to sell and to sign. So we're super excited about that. Um, our first reader today is William West. William West grew up in Texas, attended UT, and graduated from the University of Houston. He has always held a deep interest in human behavior, which found a place in his debut novel, Evolution of a Young Man in Love. Please welcome William West. Thank you. Very <laughs> yeah. nice to be here together even though we're not a huge crowd, it's just mm -hmm. us. <laughs> to share uh, writers and readers sharing time together about, about writing and reading. Um, I read an interview once with uh, Kirk Vonnegut and Ron Springer, and Kirk Vonnegut said during this interview, to summarize it, that uh, if, you're, if you're a writer, a, any type of writing, whether your writing is published or not, uh, whether it has a wide audience or not, you're still part of a, a writing community. So I've, I've, I've felt that way ever since I you know, got that confirmation from Kurt Vonnegut mm -hmm. um, that uh, even these small groups is, is something important for us to share and learn from each other. So um, th this is my book, which I think that you two have actually seen before, as I've seen yours. Uh, and I was, was trying to figure out which uh, chapter or section I wanted to read of the book. It was really difficult for me to decide because every time I would start to read pieces, I would come across something that was a spoiler for something that had been before in the book. So, you know, I, I didn't want to include that in a reading. So I thought I would just start with the first chapter, a good, a good place to start. Um, and uh, actually, as I noticed, I was reviewing and reading again the first chapter. I, I kind of came across an idea of what has always stumped me when people ask me, well, what's your book about? Because um, I come up with something different every single time, almost. So when I read this, the first paragraph, I thought, well, that's kind of like just what the book is about right there. Cause as you'll see when I, when I read it, it's a little symbolic of, of finding your place in the world and finding how you fit in that world, whether, you know, including all the, the tragedies and, and loves and everything that happens to you, uh, not just to, to Joseph Hawking, who is the main character in my story, but to, to all of us. So he sort of, in my mind, represents all of us as we explore our own lives. Uh, so I will be reading just the, the first chapter, just oddly enough, titled Present Day One. Attracted by the spell of death, the fly came in through the back door, carelessly left open. A large fly from the sound of its wings beating like a distant drum as it flitted nervously in and out of the early morning light that sifted gently through the wooden slats covering the windows. The fly lit upon the desk among tubes of eyeliner and skin cream and photos of people hugging and leaning into each other with broad smiles and eager eyes and a mirror which reflected the bed where the light had reached across the room and touched her legs spread ever so slightly. The fly came up into the light stirring motes of dust around the bed, searching for a place to lay its eggs, and landed on her arm where it waited for her to stir, to rise in a panic, fearing that she had overslept. In the stillness, the light moved up over the soft curve of her body, warming her skin, then glistening in her hair, which was now matted from the blood on the pillow. Instinctively, the fly moved to the soft lobe of her ear. She did not stir. She would not rise. She would not greet another day. She would not be discovered until her employer raised concerns about her absence. 
Death was never a pretty sight. Joseph Hawking imagined the scene through the eyes of a tiny intruder hovering above the body as the murder was described by David Snow, the host of Houston Magazine. Joseph watched the show weekly. He enjoyed its controversial content, but more importantly, he had known David Snow since they were boyhood friends. He felt ambivalent about David's notoriety, but he knew that David was perfect for the job. There was something different about this show, though. Joseph had followed the murders since they began two weeks ago. All of the victims were young, attractive women who lived in the same part of the city, an upscale area of townhomes and high-rise apartments. All the victims were Caucasian, all had blonde hair, and all were found nude in bed. The cause of death in each case was determined to be exsanguination due to traumatic injury. No further details were revealed. The crime scenes were gruesome and so similar that the Houston police put out a warning of a possible serial killer and urged women to use caution, lock all doors and windows and call 911 if any suspicious person attempted to enter their homes. No suspect description was given because there were no witnesses. He was known by the press as the bedroom killer, a label they had come up with to personalize the cases and stir interest with little concern for the pandemonium it might create. Joseph Hawking was nestled in the soft cushions of his sofa in his Austin home, 165 miles away, a goblet of Pinot Noir from his fam fam favorite Hill Country winery cupped in the palm of his left hand. He gently swirled the wine as his right hand hovered ever so slightly above the surface of his cell phone, which lay on the sofa cushions near his leg. His solemn eyes moved thoughtfully between the phone and the television. He had wanted to talk to David for a few days now, and he thought this might be a good time. Joseph still considered David a friend, even though they had not seen each other since college, except once when David's father died and Joseph returned to Houston briefly to attend the funeral. They had gone about their separate lives, and Joseph was fine with that until recently when Joseph began to feel uneasy about what had happened on the day of the funeral. There was an urgency to talk about it now, but Joseph was reluctant to pick up where they had left off to renew their unspoken competitive nature. David was covering the murders on his show, interviewing one of the detectives investigating the case. Joseph sensed a hesitation in David's voice, almost a polite respect for the detective's job not the usual brashness, the tone of light arrogance that always gave the impression he knew more than the person he was interviewing. That was what had been bothering him about this show. Joseph glanced down at his cell phone, an unwelcome guest in his house waiting for him to start a conversation. His fingers began to strum the cushion of the sofa as if they were disconnected from the rest of his body. And the phone rang and it was David. Joseph looked back at the television, where David was sitting, talking with the detective. Taped earlier, edited, still can't remove the discomfort in his voice. Funny, a coincidence his calling. Could have sensed, can't help but wonder if there is some controlling force, divine or mystic, sends us crashing into each other, a reminder that we have unfinished business. David has the habit of always getting into some predicament won't admit that he needs me to bail him out. Hey, Hawk, goes from the past, bro. Not totally unexpected, Joseph said. Funny thing is, I was just about to call you. That is funny, David said. I'm going to get right to the point, though. Have you been keeping up on the bedroom killer? I'm watching your show right now, Joseph said. That's when David pointed out that he had dated one of the most recent victims. Joseph didn't know what to say, and of course, the first thing to come out of his mouth was the obvious. Have you told the police about this? No, David said, I, I thought it was just a coincidence at first, because I happen to live in the same part of town as all the victims. But now I'm not so sure. This whole thing has me a little frazzled. It might give them a lead. They might have, they might be some connection. Yeah, me. His voice was beginning to show his frustration and near panic. You need to help me with something better than that. 
They will suspect me for sure. I'll probably be arrested. What good would that do? If you cooperate with them, then maybe you can learn more about the cases. But they're not telling the public. At this stage, it's best to go with the coincidence theory. I guess you're right that it's going to be big news that could destroy me. Only if you're the killer. Otherwise, it will probably increase your viewing audience. You could convince the police to keep it quiet so the killer won't know. All I know is you can't wait until another woman you dated is killed. I'm sorry to make light of this, but we are talking about something close to a pandemic. Wants me to bail him out again. Needs me to. This time is no different, except this time the magnitude of the problem is much greater. Joseph never got around to telling David his news, not right away, anyway. There would be time. The fact that their paths kept crossing made Joseph examine the reasons for these seemingly coincidental meetings. He felt that something was driving their destinies back toward each other, and no matter what they did, the inevitable was going to happen. If there were clues, he wanted to find them. If there was a way to prevent that inevitable event, their unfinished business, he wanted to know what it was. What he feared most was the ominous prediction of Carolyn's palm reader, the portent of a tragic event in their connected futures, and that his life was predestined to follow in the footsteps of his uncle, who died at age 29, the same age Joseph was now. As he sipped his wine, his mind calculated all the possibilities as it edged back rapidly to the beginning when he first began to notice that he was different, to examine how his own predicament evolved. Joseph and David were 13, and their families were on vacation together in Galveston. Oddly enough, that was the first time when David and Joseph were linked to a murder. And the next chapter starts with memory of 13. Did I drive somebody away? She had to I don't know if there's maybe not a question type, but that's all I have to, from my, my portion. Um, I don't know if I mixed anybody up in there where they tried to give you a little warning. Uh, that a couple of portions in that first chapter, um, they go into uh, like a stream of consciousness, um, which is, like one of my favorite writers is James Joyce. I have a little bit of influence from him when I do that. And it's conveniently their italicized way. So when you read the book, it's not that confusing. You see it's different. So. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Mm -hmm.